Hello everyone, my name is Thomas Park and I want to say wish everyone a happy Juneteenth. I hope that you are doing something or if you're seeing the video late that you have you did do something that was uh, good for you and reflective of uh, this new our new holiday and how we use it to our advantage if you will. But today I wanted to just, I appreciate Crystal at the Warnest for allowing me to read and I just wanted to share excerpts from three small pieces of literature that I think have a lot to do with um, how we should celebrate, how we should celebrate and stay focused, especially on MLK Day and Juneteenth and days like that that we really had to struggle for uh, because history is very important. One other thing that I wanted to mention that I want you to, to float around in, in your heads is that, you know, what we can do to fight against the banning of books because the banning of books goes with history, goes with the banning of language, the banning of voice. Uh, and it's an important issue that is on the rise. The other part is about rhetoric and rhetoric and the rhetoric that's being used today uh, in society surrounding almost all events. And rhetoric, rhetoric is you know, basically the art of persuasion, of persuasive talk. And so in these three pieces, I want you to listen to the persuasive speech. And this first excerpt, which is sort of like, will serve as a baseline for my reading. I'm actually gonna read from one of America's first presidents, uh, a great man in history that we learn about all the time. It's good to know about him. Um, I'm talking about Thomas Jefferson. And you can look in the Library of Congress, you can look in the Smithsonian, you can look at, at Yale and any major university and you will find his book, Jefferson's Notes on Virginia. And in his book, in his treaties, he was writing for the French people, but in his treaties, he talks about everything wonderful and glorious and even problematic about Virginia. His rivers, his mountains, his caves, his agriculture, his Native American population, uh, the minerals, everything. But he has this section that he talks about the Negroes. And uh, Jefferson's notes came out in 1787, not like a class. But I want you to read, I want you to listen to some of the words of a founding father and taking consideration what Jefferson, what Frederick Douglass, when I read Douglass, is gonna say about founding fathers. But Thomas Jefferson, and this is the same Jefferson who built University of Virginia, or had it built, and when he didn't like where it was, he had his slaves to take it down piece by piece and move it up to Monticello. And it was still a hundred years before people of color could attend that university. But in Jefferson's notes, he says, it will probably be asked, why not retain and incorporate the blacks into the state and thus save the expense of supplying by importation of white settlers to make up for the vacancies when they leave? He says, deep-rooted prejudices entertained by the whites 10,000 recollections by the blacks of the injuries they have sustained, new provocations, the real distinctions which nature has made, whatever they are, and many other circumstances will divide us into parties and produce convulsions which will probably never end but in the extermination of one or the other race. This is Jefferson. He says, to these objections, which are political, may be added others, which are physical and moral. And this is where it gets really wonderful. He says, the first difference that which strikes us is that of color. Whether the black of the Negro re resides in the reticular membrane between the skin and scarf skin, whatever that is, or the scarf skin itself, 
whether it proceeds from the color of the blood or the color of the bowel or from that of some other secretion within the man. The difference is fixed in nature and is as real as if its seat and cause were better known to us. And it's, the difference, and it's this difference of no importance, he asks. It, it is not the foundation of a greater or less share of beauty of the two races. There are not fine mixtures of red and white. The expressions of every passion, the expressions of every, the expressions of every passion by greater or less suffusions of color in, in the one preferable to the eternal monotony which reigns in the consciences of the, of the immovable veil of black which covers all the emotions of the other race. And to these flowing hair, a more elegant symmetry of form, their own judgment in favor of the whites, declared by their preference of the, declared by their preference of the whites, uh, and uniformly as is as is the preference of the orangutan for the black woman over those of his own species, which is a sentence that always throws me. Um, he says, in the circumstance of superior beauty, is thought worthy of attention in the propagation. He looks at the propagations of horses, dogs, and other domestic animals. Why not in that of man, besides those of color, figure, and hair, or other physical distinctions proving a difference of race? They have less hair on their face and body. They secrete less by the kidneys and more by the glands of skins, which give them a very strong and disagreeable odor. And that wouldn't... That, that could also be assuaged by not having a bath and having to work in fields for sun up to sunset. You know, that might cause an odor. Um, he says, the greater degree of transpiration renders them more tolerant of heat and less so of cold than the whites. Perhaps, too, a difference of structure in the pulmonary apparatus. I didn't know he had a doctor before his name also. But, I mean, these are things that... that uh, a president wrote, and we know in the early 1900s, many of the presidents still were not down with, with you know, people, they wanted black people free, but they didn't like necessarily black people. He also says that a black, after a hard day's labor, hard labor through the day, will be induced by the slightest amusement to sit up until midnight or later, though acknowledging he must be out at the first of dawn in the morning. They are at least brave and more adventuresome, but this may proceed from a want of forethought. Oh my gosh. I, I, I read this to my, my students and I let them read it and just consider you know, what the danger in, in rhetoric is. Uh, he goes on to say, uh, you know, you can read this, you can find this. Uh, we, don't, we, we, we don't have a lot of time here for this. But um, I find all of, all of his words about the Negroes or about the black man compelling, especially not even mentioning Sally Hemings name. Uh, so with that said, and this was 135 years before, since I came today, <laughs> forgive my tie, it's hot all over the United States today. So I, and it's hot here, and it's not, it's not hot in, 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 at the studio, but um, it's very hot outside, and I wanted to just feel with you the heat. But I'm reading from Frederick Douglass, so I was trying to look as much like Frederick, Mr. Douglass, as I could. But in 1865, Frederick Douglass was asked to I mean, he was always this fascinating man because he had escaped, learn how to read, escape slavery. If you don't know the story, you know, we should familiarize ourselves with his story. Um, and he became a protege of the abolitionist. And I mean, he started newspapers. He traveled five, six, seven months a year speaking and touring. And, uh, and at one point in time in America, Probably around the time when um, 45 became president and you know, people started taking pictures of him. I mean, I'm, I'm saying this, he was the most photographed man in America. You know, from the time he began to be photographed, everybody wanted to see Frederick Douglass and there were so many pictures. I didn't believe it. And I looked at, he, at one point in time, he was the most photographed man in America. But uh, in 1852, on July 5th, 
he was asked to give a keynote address uh, at an Independence Day celebration. And he was asked, or well, the day asked, the, the celebration asked, he was addressing what to the, what to the slave is the 4th of July. The longer piece, I have very small excerpts, but again, his rhetoric, the rhetoric he uses in addressing uh, these women, there probably were a few, probably were a few men there, but it was societal women, that's influential women who had influential husbands who probably, you know, could maybe help the cause, cause. And so he was there, and his address was "What to the slave this is the Fourth of July," and Douglas again, as I said, he was a powerful orator. This was in New York. Uh, in the Corinthian Hall in Rochester. And the speech actually has been called scathing. And it's scathing because of the rhetoric. He says no bad words. It's, it's scathing because of the way he formalized it and, and delivered it. Um, and he says, he says, this 4th of July is yours. It's not mine. You may rejoice. I must mourn. And he acknowledged, in this speech, he acknowledged the forefathers of America. He acknowledged them, calling them the architects of the Declaration of Independence for their commitment to the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Doesn't sound angry? It doesn't. He says, fellow citizens, I am not warning in respect for the fathers of this republic. He says, I respect these people. I respect them. He says, the signers of the Declaration of Independence were brave men. They were great men, too. Great enough to give frame to a great age. And it, it does not happen often. It does not happen often to a nation to raise at one time such a number of truly great men. So I mean, you know, think about what he's saying. Think about what he's suggesting to them. And these, all these great people he know that are still in bondage. This is, this is what I'm arguing you know, that don't have a chance to yet to be great. He says, from the point at which I'm compelled to view them, these American diplomats is certainly the most favorable. It certainly is not, is not. He says, this, this point from which I'm compelled to view them is, is certainly not the most favorable. And yet I cannot contemplate their great deeds with less than admiration. He said, I, I don't look at these guys like they're not my favorite people. But what they have done is magnificent. This is great. Uh, he said, there were statesmen, patriots, and heroes. And for the good they did and the principles they contended for, I will unite with you to honor their memory. And so, again, I'm just suggesting, like, to listen to him, to, you know, how we must fight our battles, our political battles, and this and that, uh, with people that we don't actually, we may never agree with, you know? And they may never agree with us, but hopefully we can find a court. Here he asks, he says, fellow citizens, again, he says, pardon me and allow me to ask you, why am I called here to speak to you? What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Again, something we, want, we wanted. Uh, are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that declaration of independence extended to us? And am I therefore called upon to bring our humble offerings to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings re resulting from your independence to us? He says, um, he asks, he says, would, would, to God, would to God, both for your sakes and ours, that an affirmative answer could be truthfully returned to these questions. Then, my, then would my task be light here today and my burden easy and delightful? And for who is there so cold that a nation's sympathy could not warm him? Who is so obdurate and dead to the claims of gratitude that would not thankfully acknowledge such priceless benefits? Who is so stolen and selfish that would not give his voice to the swell of hallelujahs of a nation's jubilee? Still, you know, this religious, spiritual appeal. When the chains, who would not do this when the chains of servitude have been torn from, him, from his limbs? He says, I am not that man. In that case, 
like that the dumb might eloquently speak and the lame might leap as a heart. And I think about a brother from South Carolina um, that hopes to be a vice president. But such is not the state of the case. I say it with a sad sense of disparity, he says. I say it with a sad sense of disparity between us. I am not included in the pale of, of your glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. And the blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is not shared by you and not me. And things have certainly changed, but if one would dare to just pull one layer of that onion off, you'll see that you know several, several disparities still exist in the world today for between the dominant culture and people of color. So he says, the 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may be yours, I must mourn. Uh, and this is like one of, just an excerpt from one of his more famous speeches. And so I guess I posit, I want to posit like, Juneteenth is, is ours. And so, I guess I'm saying we should still, there should be time for remembrance of the ancestral past and there probably is some mourning and mourning and cool tears are good, but at the same time, we still, you know, we, I, I, I don't want to be, sound like we should rejoice, we should rejoice and say hallelujah and dance and line dance and sing praises and eat well and all of that. Uh, I want you to think about what Douglas was saying about any day, uh, anything that some people have died for and fought for, and even in my humanity, I can't, I can't imagine having to do that every day or to do to be uh, threatened with lynching. But, you know, I've been put against the wall and things like that and accosted by the police. Not recently, but I just, I, I can't imagine how bad it was. I try, and I still can't imagine. So we've come, for, we've come so far. And so this was in 1852. This last thing I want to read, slavery was abolished in 1865, well, 52, it's like 13 years later. And frankly, Douglas, we know he had his sons join and fight for the union and, um, to try to model and do everything to be an American citizen, to actually fit in. And so that's just like, in this tightness of Juneteenth, I mean, like, trying to fit in, trying to be an American. It's like, and what people don't understand is so, has a way to be so taxing on the psyche of a person of color in the day-to-day go of it. So this last poem, or this poem I'm going to read, is by one of my favorite poets. Very short, a sonnet with my lines and inscriptions on it, uh, written by Claude McKay in 1919. Claude McKay is a Jamaican poet. I forget when he died. In this, he died early, but in the maybe 40s, 50s, maybe. Uh, but it's called If We Must Die. And it's chock full of metaphors and things I hope that we can use today. I use them every day because I feel like I die every day. You know, the Bible says we die daily. There's a quote in there, it's a Bible verse. Um, you know, so we can die to some things and are born to other things. Um, or we can die to some things and they can be gone from us forever, like racism. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Uh, he says that we must die. Let it not be like hogs hunted and penned in an inglorious spot while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs. While around us bark the mad and hungry dogs making their mark at our cursed lot. If we must die, oh, let us nobly die so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain. Then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us though dead. 
O kinsmen, we must meet the common foe. Though far outnumbered, let us show brave, and for their thousand blows, deal one death blow. What though before us lies the open grave, like men, we'll face the murderous pack, the murderous, the murderous cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying but fighting back. So, um, the poem was actually about the lynching, you know, after slavery, and then there was construction, and then the Ku Klux Klan, and the, the deconstruction of everything that we were trying to do, the, the, the death of some black cities, Tulsa, and a couple other places, whenever, you know, like, we're just sort of trying to mind our own business. Um, we were, because in, in those cities that, that were prospering, where we had our banks, we had everything we needed, we knew how to do everything. Um, and they were just met with so much anger and venom and hatred and jealousy. You know, just like that same sort of spirit could destroy a city, you know, an individual has, does stand a chance when he runs into that, uh, unless we are very strong. So this whole idea that, you know, I want you to look at the metaphorical lynching, you know, the different ways that the world can do it. And again, Ida B. Wells, great little lady, African-American pioneer. If you can look her up, please look her up. Um, I'm using her so I won't get in a whole lot of trouble for what I'm about to say, because we can be so mean to each other, all right? We can be so mean to each other as a race. So, and I think about Ida B. Wells, because she pointed that out when she was trying to bring some of the poor and indignant uh, sharecroppers and everybody to Chicago, but a lot of the blacks who were already there was like, you know, you know, y'all, they need to stay over there because they're a bit uncouth. And, you know, and we sort of like understand, but make sure we're not doing our own lynching. Um, these people who make their mark at our accursed lot, we're, I look at that like, you know, we're not accursed. We don't look at ourselves as accursed. They look at us, we're accursed to them. For whatever reasons. And this is just Thomas Park talking to you. I can't contemplate deep, deep hatred or deep, deep suspicions or what have you. Uh, this other thing, uh, we must meet the common foe. And I think whatever the common foe is today, uh, we have individual common foes and we have collectively a common foe or common foes. So we must do that. And I'm, and I'm gonna stop, but there's a, 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 an old sage guy around here called Dr. Cosmos George, and he does a lot of NAACP stuff. And he told me one day, like, well, you know, he was taking the blame. He said, I think sometimes we have dropped the ball because we should, you know, there's more we could do. And there's always more uh, in your, makeup and who you are you can always do something and so he was saying that sometimes as black people you know we we get the ball we make we do something good and we slam the touchdown ball down you know not kicking the extra point but the game's not over the point is the game's not over so let's maybe be like Walter Payton if you can remember old school people Walter Payton would make a touchdown he'd hand the ball off to the official he never really slammed or did anything because the game wasn't over and I was trying to think of a metaphor as you know because we had like Jasmine Crockett we got so many stars rising in politics that are trying to look out for people of color and keep it balanced and keep it fair because fairness is important but uh I look at it like we have to be like those defensive backs. I like that move when they break up a play and they do like that. Like, no, it ain't coming, you know. It's like the game's not won or anything, but you're not, no, you're not throwing this. You're not sneaking this past me. Uh, I'm trying to get used to Juneteenth. I don't want to do anything tomorrow but write, do something that Thomas wants to do. Um, enjoy some sunshine, embrace the heat, 
But I'm trying to, you know, be different. I can't afford to be off. I know that some of us can't afford to be off. Some of our employers won't let us be off. They just won't, not on that day. Um, but there's a lot. So there's a lot to celebrate. And the celebration should be every day. The, the, we should celebrate some freedoms every day, I think. And I thank you very much for allowing me to be here. I wish you all many, many, many more MLK days, many, many, many more Juneteenth, and many, many, many more birthdays. Thank you.